Larry Mueller. I'm a professional oboist and oboe repairman in San Antonio, Texas. I started playing the oboe in the 70s and my first oboe teacher, Ed Blado, was a Cincinnati Conservatory uh, graduate. And he taught for the Toledo Board of Education, went around teaching all the private oboe students. And he encouraged me to do some of my own oboe repair, whatever I could. In his words, uh, even if I wound up in a big city playing the oboe, I'd have a hard time probably finding decent oboe repair, and I found that to be very true. I started out doing repairs uh, for mostly for my students and myself. Uh, I was better able to do that than sending them to the local music stores, and that's how I got into repair. One of the first things I do when looking at an oboe is to check for cracks because that can be uh, one of the more advanced repairs, one of the more expensive and time consuming repairs. So I like to use a little 10 times magnifier and look especially between the trills and the trills in the first finger and just generally anywhere in the top area. After I've done that, it's time to move on to the adjustments. For those who are not oboists, the octave keys are named after uh, the order in which you come to them when you're ascending a scale. This is the thumb octave key, the back octave key. Sometimes they only have the one. That's the first octave key. That's for E through G sharp at the top of the staff. The second octave key is this knuckle one for A through C at the top of the staff. And then the third one is for extremely soft entrances, uh, high E and above. And that should never press on this uh, first octave lever below it. So they look like they do. It doesn't have much travel. Sometimes it even has a cork under here. It looks like the, the two should open together, but they never should. And this is the adjustment screw here for the third octave key. That should be adjusted to just barely open. You should barely be able to slip a uh, fine piece of paper under here. That'll help to keep those notes down and, and it doesn't need to vent much at all to do its job. If things are clicking together here, you can adjust this screw on the first octave lever uh, a little bit downwards so that uh, it can't, it, it'll tip that key a bit so it can't travel up as far and that, that can help. Also this third octave key oftentimes gets a little bit bent. If you press on it too hard, it's held here, and it's a pretty long lever to there, and it can tip downwards. And I'll use uh, my pad slick under there and, and bend that up a little bit, maybe support it here and, and bend that up, put a little more space in between there. So we've talked now about the octave screws. The next screw we come to is on the half hole key here. That finger is only up for high C sharp above the staff. And that's uh, the last adjustment we're going to do. That's for tuning on high C sharp. That key is usually rather low, uh, but things in the right hand will affect the tuning on that as well. So we, we need to get the uh, bottom of the oboe adjusted and we'll come back to that. I want to talk for a second about uh, the cigarette paper I'm using. This is Club brand. It's about seven ten thousandths of an inch thick. Uh, and it's some of the thinner paper. It's ungummed and it has a good feel to it. I can feel the, the, the texture of it as I pull it out from under a pad. Some repairmen are using something called mylar which is a Christmas tree tinsel. Some helium balloons are made out of mylar and that's a half a thou thick which is a little thinner than my paper but I find it too slippery. It's a plastic and uh, I just don't have the same feel for it. Now we come to the main area of the left hand section. It involves these four screws here. I'm going to first adjust the two little pads together. I'm going to press on the first finger right hand uh, key. I'm using my left thumb to do that to free up my right hand. I'm right handed. So I can open these two little uh, keys that way. You need a little bit of wiggle room in this bridge mechanism. Uh, otherwise those keys can be inadvertently held open by the right hand section. You need just the smallest amount of play. I don't know if you can see that there before it picks up the bridge key. And on the other side the D trill 
there needs to be a little play there. Otherwise, these two little pads can be inadvertently held open, and then nothing works. Uh, it'll cause those uh, the B flat and the A to be quite sharp if those pads are a little bit open. This screw here will affect the bridge key. The bridge, the bridge is a rocker mechanism, and if you turn that screw a little bit tighter clockwise, uh, it'll give you a little more clearance here on the bridge. Now we've got uh, these two pads held open. We're going to put a little uh, triangle, a uh, thin piece of cigarette paper under the C. And I like it to close with about equal pressure with the B flat. And I'm using my uh, thumb here on the first finger right hand key to open and close those. I've got those adjusted fairly equally. And that would be this screw here. You can see how those screws are in relation to one another. The next is to adjust the middle finger with the little C pad above it. And I'm going to do that by opening up the first finger right hand. We'll open up the little C. I'm going to stick my paper under there and check that against the middle finger. That adjustment is made with this screw right here. You can follow the middle finger key around to the foot of the key, and that's the screw it connects to for the little C. Turning that, count, uh, turning that clockwise will make the C close a little bit quicker in relation. Turning that screw counterclockwise will make, allow the middle finger to close quicker. A lot of repairmen refer to the main finger keys that the fingers press as the primary key and the, thing, uh, the, the key that is operated by a primary key that your finger does not directly control as a secondary key. It's usual to slightly favor the primary key closure over the secondary. So this would be, uh, I'd say, equal to or less than, slightly less than the pressure here it would be what you would want to feel with the cigarette paper. Next we move on to the third finger and the little B flat pad above it. We're going to do the same thing that we just did with the others. The right hand first, uh, first finger key opens the little B flat. We're going to close it here with the third finger key on the paper and check those two. And this one, if anything, uh, this should be favored a little bit above that. Fairly equal, but maybe just slightly less here. And that's controlled with this little screw there. And that's the left hand section. One thing on the top joint I haven't mentioned is there's a little screw under here that's kind of hard to see on this oboe. Uh, this is a Kingwood Yamaha oboe that I've been playing on recently. Uh, Lorays will have the screw up here. And that's an adjustment for the A flat to B flat. That's your A flat fingering to B flat so that the A flat key through this arm here holds the middle finger key down. Uh, there's a kind of a wide range of an adjustment for that and, and it'll hold that down. I'm more concerned with the pitch of the uh, B on that. The, the, the height of this key can be adjusted by this screw. You can have that key a little bit higher if you need the help, to, uh, particularly to keep your high B up to pitch. You can back that little screw out on, on this uh, mechanism here and that'll raise that raise or lower that uh, and I would tune that uh, to suit the way you play your reeds uh, the, the tuning on your instrument so when you look at the, the height of these keys generally this is going to be maybe a sixteenth of an inch high the first finger for tuning on high C sharp this one is going to be uh, probably the highest of the three these two will be either equal or, or the middle finger will be a little bit higher keep the high B pitch up and then uh, this would be about what you would expect in, in a key height. And that's the top joint. Okay now we come to the bottom joint. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the naming of the keys. A manufacturer would call this key here the G key. It's the first finger of the right hand 
because that's over the tone hole where the G would sound. A player is going to call that the F sharp key. Uh, so it depends on who you're talking to. I, I usually call these by the names that the player is going to call it. That's who I'm usually dealing with, and I don't want there to be confusion with them. Uh, anyway, that's why I'm calling uh, things first, second, and third finger keys to keep it as generic as I can. Uh, now we come to the right hand section adjust, adjustments, and we're going to test the first finger pad with this little arm that affects the F sharp to G sharp adjustment. Here it's rather loose. I've got two top joints for this instrument and it's not adjusted for this one. If I needed that to close uh, the G sharp for that trill, F sharp to G sharp, I would turn this counterclockwise. If this pad weren't quite hitting, I would turn it, uh, I'm sorry, I would turn that clockwise to close tighter on there. If uh, this first finger pad wasn't hitting, I'd turn it counterclockwise. Now we come to the main adjustment area of the uh, right hand section. It's going to be the way the middle finger closes this little F sharp pad and the way the third finger closes that. And they also adjust to the forked F uh, resonance pad over here. It's usual, uh, that's a lot of things to adjust together to back off this uh, F resonance screw, maybe a full turn. And I'm going to do that here. The third finger opens that key. The middle finger closes it again. And I've adjusted it out to where you can hear that tapping sound. So it's not quite closing when it should. That way I know I can focus on the adjustments here without that uh, F resonance being too tight. Now I'm going to test with cigarette paper these two pads. And again, uh, they're going to be roughly equal, if anything, a little lighter here. The, the reason for that is you've got, say, these rods that go through those keys is 90 thousandths of an inch. You can't have a 90 thousandths rod running through a 90 thousandths hinge tube because they would just stick. You need a little clearance for movement and for oil. You can see this little key here is pressed on on either one of these two screws. It's going to have a little bit of tip to it with the clearance that's in there depending on the fingering combination. Uh, so there's no way to really have everything close perfectly all the time. So we're going to favor the primary keys uh, in every situation. To adjust the middle finger to that little F sharp pad we're going to, the top of these two screws here, adjust that. To adjust uh, the third finger to that little pad, that's only for forked F. This screw here is going to do that. That can be one of the lighter adjustments on the oboe. It's only for forked F, which American players aren't especially fond of anyhow. But you don't want to sacrifice the closure of the third finger. Then we're going to go back and put this back in. With both the second and third fingers down, we're going to uh, tighten that screw a little bit clockwise until we no longer hear that tapping sound. That's pretty good there. I'm also going to check it with cigarette paper usually needs just a tad more of a turn after you've gotten rid of the tapping sound. That's it there. So that's the main adjustment section of the right hand. We've got a couple other screws here we haven't talked about. This screw here works on this rocker mechanism for the little uh, F resonance. This will control the height of this third finger key. On many oboes, the E is rather sharp. And if you will tighten that screw down until the E is a little better in tune, that, that'll allow, uh, allow this key here to open a little less far. So that's what I use that screw for. It may also be meant for the adjustment of the height, uh, how far the uh, F resonance opens. But uh, most American players, at least, are more concerned with their tuning on the E. 
not all oboes have this little screw here. That's also to affect how high the fork def resonance can raise. Uh, I'm not usually too concerned with that screw. Now we'll talk about the, the bottom of the section, the stuff from the low C key, uh, well, which a maker would call a low D because that's where the D sounds. Uh, we want to make sure that this pad for the low C closes, but, but it still has to close the middle finger key just slightly. Uh, the pad for the low C ha has to be solid or your C won't sound, the low notes won't, won't respond. Uh, so we need that to just close a little bit on the uh, middle finger key. And that would be this screw here. This oboe has two screws. It has a Philly D mechanism, which uh, closes the third finger key most of the way. That's for, uh, that helps the response on high D, either tonguing or slurring to it, to have that key down quite, quite a ways. It's usual to leave it up just a little bit, that way it won't have such a flattening effect on the uh, high D. Uh, so you may or may not have that on there. It can be added if you need, if you feel a need for that, if you're missing your high Ds. Then we're going to check the uh, adjustment of the D flat to E flat trill. I'm pressing the left E flat key and, and the, the C is sharp or D flat and I don't want to hear that tapping sound on the, on the uh, E flat key. You can hear that just a little bit. So I would tighten this screw right here on the E flat key. This screw can affect the height, uh, key height of the left E flat. And there's also a little screw right here that connects a, a bar over to the third finger that can also affect the height of the left E flat. Those usually don't need much attention. Sometimes that left E flat doesn't open quite high enough and you can play around with that. Sometimes the E flat's open all the time because something's bent in there. You might back that screw out just a little bit, uh, but usually it's because something is bent in this area here and tipping those keys, that left pinky cluster, over in such a way to hold that open. So look for bent stuff up there if you can't get the the pad height right here on the E flat or, or if it's standing open all the time at rest. Then we have the low B to C sharp trill adjustment. Uh, some student oboes don't have that but I'm pressing the low B key and the C sharp and I don't want to hear tapping there. And those things will be uh, further adjusted in more detail with the play test of the instrument. And then the final adjustments are the low B and B flat need to close together. I'm pressing the uh, B flat lever and I want both of those pads to close together. Some people consider the B to be the primary key in this case and that can be a little lighter. Uh, it's usual, uh, I was taught to press both of those in the middle. So I'm really pressing on both keys. And if you have this adjusted a little bit light, then that will work. Uh, both will close if you're pressing on both of them here. But make them more or less equal. And that adjustment for B to B flat is this screw right here. Many oboes also have a screw here, which is equally effective. In, uh, if you tighten either of those screws, uh, the B flat will close faster in relation to the B. If things are too tight here, if the screw's down too far, if there is a screw there, you can inadvertently hold open this little resonance pad that not obo all oboes have, and that will affect some. Uh, that'll cause some tuning issues in the right hand notes, at the top of the staff especially. If you're having troubles with uh, with the screws, maybe they're too tight, maybe they're too loose, they're not staying in place. If they're too tight, I'll put a little uh, heat from my jeweler's torch on, on, uh, on the uh, screw arrangement and, and heat just a little bit of penetrating oil in. That usually does it. Uh, sometimes you can see some rust coming out. If they're too tight, you can put a little nail polish. Uh, I mean, if they're too loose, you can put a little nail polish, uh, kind of bind the head of the screw to the post 
uh, to, to the little chimney that the screw goes into, the little socket. You can back out the screw a ways and put some uh, Loctite on it. This is available at any uh, hardware store. There are different types. There are permanent ones that are really meant to hold like a glue and there are uh, removable Loctites that don't, don't hold as strong. You can still adjust the screw later. And that's the kind I would use. So back out the screw, get a little bit of this on the threads of the screw and turn it in. If it's even looser than that, you can use some smooth jaw pliers uh, and take out the screw. I would use my uh, tweezer screwdrivers that, that would hold the screw and you can squeeze around on the screw threads and mash them a little bit. You can uh, take the key off and, and kind of uh, mash just a little bit the little socket. Uh, it, it's best on the bottom part and kind of make that a little bit oval shaped, kind, kind of bend it a little bit out of round and the screw will fit tighter. You don't want to mar the instrument, it's a little more hidden down there than if you do it at the top. So that are, those are some techniques you can use to get uh, the screws tightened up a little bit so they won't slip out of place so much. And that's uh, oboe adjusting. I want to show a couple spots that are a little different on English horn than they are on oboe. You have an extra key for, uh, for tuning on the English horn of the octaves of the uh, A. Uh, acoustically it's a little different. You, you have some uh, different octave spacing. Here with the third finger it affects not only these two together but you have this little thing sort of akin to the uh, to the forked F resonance on an oboe. So you've got three pads that have to close together and I would have the other joint together uh, so that I could use the first finger here to open the little B flat. So you might want to throw this out, adjust those first, and then put this back in. So that's one difference on the left hand of the English horn. The lower joint of the English horn, this area here, is considerably more complicated than on oboe. This key, you can see in its natural state, is open. It's not closed like on the oboe. It's not actually an F resonance key. We might still refer to it as that because we're so used to that but it's only closed for low D and below. Both the second and third fingers of the right hand have to be pressed down before that's closed. And you've got a rather complicated rocker mechanism. And uh, this gets a little confusing. You've got three screws here and they all kind of do the same thing. If you need this a little tighter, any of those screws will do. I would start with them about halfway down so you've got room to adjust either in or out with the screws. This has to be one of the definitely one of the lightest adjustments. Because of this rocker mechanism it's easy for either of these to not quite close and then your low notes won't work. After I've done that adjustment and got that uh, to close but just uh, lightly, I like to go back and with both of these keys down, the second and third fingers, make sure that you've got closure on those. They'll seal, if this is too tight, these will seal one at a time when you're checking the second and third fingers, but when they're both down, they're not going to work. So I like to go back and check with both of those down. Make sure this is closing, but just barely. So that's the big adjustment down there on English horn. The last thing I do with an adjustment is a playing test. I'm going to play a diatonic scale down, starting on B, just with light finger pressure, one finger at a time, feeling for any little bumps. And if I have to push a little bit to get the next note, then uh, I would look at that area in more detail. Maybe checking pads for leaks or double checking my adjustments. out pretty well. I'm going to check the trill fingerings. To check the F sharp to G sharp trill, uh, most oboists will play a low C and they'll uh, touch the G sharp key to see if that affects it. Let me throw that out just for a second. Put my glasses on so I can see the screw I'm turning. 
I'll throw that out so you can hear what that's like. So there you go, and we're just going to gradually tighten that screw until that doesn't happen. Real close. And then I'm going to try the D flat to E flat trill. With a low uh, D flat, the E flat should not affect that, and if it does, then you would tighten this screw here a little bit, uh, gradually until that doesn't happen. And then low C sharp to B trill. Uh, the low B should sound equally as well with either the low C key or the C sharp key. I've been sitting here repairing and my reed's a little bit dry and otherwise not a good reed anyway. Some people will try the high D. And press on the middle finger key to make sure that doesn't make a difference. So you might double check that there. The last thing I check is I play a little bit of a scale up high to check the tuning on the high C sharp. That's a D scale. I also try a little bit of a D flat scale. If that D flat is sharp, I would adjust the screw. I would tighten it so that key is a little less high. If it's flat, I would loosen the screw so that the key can come up a little bit more. And that's the final adjustment on the oboe. Next we're going to look at doing a suction test. Uh, most, most college and better uh, players, professional players, know how to do this, but uh, I'd like to kind of get more toward a standard of how it's done. If the pads are sealing pretty well, you're going to actually get more leak out through your fingerprints than you are through the pads. So I like to lick my fingertips, uh, one to cover the bottom, and any any fingers are going to be covering keys with holes in them, aperture keys. I lick or otherwise dampen those fingers. I'm going to suck all the air out of the oboe and count the seconds. I got it just holding to my lip. I'm not pulling hard and I just wait and see. Uh, I don't have a second hand in here. But you want on a, on a student horn at least a couple of few seconds suction. On a pro horn, you're going to want uh, at least 10 seconds, I would say. I've heard of as much. It, it, it fell away right there. Uh, I'm not pulling it or, uh, other than just a tiny bit. So this has maybe uh, 12 or 15 seconds, something like that. Uh, maybe you were counting. But it's adequate. Uh, I, I, more would be better. The bottom joint, most people don't realize you can do a suction test there, too. There are different ways you can hold it. Uh, if you can get the keys to kind of go alongside your cheek, I, I wet my finger to cover the bottom. These these two fingers here, these keys uh, have holes in them. So I wet those two fingers. I'm going to hold the B and C pads down. Suck all the air out. Being careful to get around the little bridge keys there. And then I'm going to pull these uh, fingers off at least one. Uh, we'll, we'll pull off the B key and see how long that pad stays down. That's good. This lower joint's uh, for a lower joint. This is probably in a little better seal than the upper joint is. That's it. Now I want to talk about oiling the oboe, both uh, key oiling and bore oiling. We'll start with the bore oiling. Uh, so, some people think that it should not be oiled at all. It's oiled at the factory before it's produced and they think that oil can actually inhibit the vibrations of the wood, dampen the sound and take the, uh, the life out of the uh, tone. Uh, but when I see rings coming loose and that sort of thing, um, I, 
it needs some sort of hydration, and oil's easier to keep in there than water, uh, than humidity. Uh, there's also thought that mineral oils, what's, which is what's usually sold at the stores as a bore oil, that mineral oils actually break down wood fibers. So we want to use some sort of a natural oil. I use uh, Bore Doctor uh, from DoctorsProd.com. Uh, it's a vegetable-based oil. Uh, vegetable oils can get rancid is one problem with them. And uh, so vitamin E, expensive vitamin E oils are added as a uh, as a stabilizer and that makes these oils expensive. Uh, Larry Naylor up in Denver uh, also has uh, an oil that he markets and I'll try to put this information on the credits at the end of the video so you can get a hold of these uh, items. But I would not use just the regular uh, music store type oil. I start with a bell. I, I'm using a turkey feather which I just dropped. and I'm going to start with the bell it doesn't take, uh, you're better off oiling too little rather than too much. You don't want to wreck a, a set of pads. Uh, you don't want to get it all over the pads. I'm going to put some drops uh, on the feather. We're going to start with the bell and I'm just going to rub it around in there till we get a nice even coat. And I'm going to look down it and make sure uh, that, it, that it's even around there. And then we're going to move to the next joint. And I go from both directions. This is a Yamaha Kingwood oboe. You might be able to see the color of that in, in the video. Some of the Yamahas have a plastic sleeve in them. Some of the newer ones, uh, you don't want to oil that, or if it's a plastic instrument. And so this way I've rubbed most of the oil off before I get to the smaller bore of the top joint. We're through with a feather.